just want to welcome those right now who are watching online to those who are in the building. Welcome to Diversity Church, where we are different people, but we have the same God. Uh, today, in honor of all the ladies whom I want to honor as well, my beautiful wife and my mom who's also watching online, um, I just want to say happy Mother's Day as well. But I actually, in light of Mother's Day, wanted to actually start a parenting series. Now, this idea of preaching about parenting has been on my heart for a long time. I just felt like it was fitting since it's Mother's Day to start it today. The title of this series is called When I Grow Up. How many of you guys know that when you are a kid, there's certain things planted in you. There's certain foundations that when you grow up, you kind of live those out. Anybody play uh, with Barbies growing up? I know some of the dudes did too. Don't act like you were too cool for some Barbies because that little girl that you were playing with down the street, you kind of liked her. And so you were cool playing Ken to her Barbie. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Uh, And so anyway, I'm a girl dad, and so um, this prop is going to be up here for the remainder of the service because I'm going to talk about different things um, in relation to parenting, and and, uh, we're going to play house today. Hallelujah. But when you are growing up, you learn certain things, especially from your parents, that has a cycle of repeating itself when you grow up. Right, So we're going to talk about the cycle of parenting, how you were parented, how you even parent your kids will affect the next generation in different ways, maybe some positive. That's what we're going to hopefully instill in us today, but some of those things might be negative. And so whether you are a mom, whether you are waiting to be a mom or a dad, or maybe you're just a child, we're going to learn some practical things in this place throughout this series, and we're going to even get healed of maybe some wounds in this place throughout this series. So again, in light of Mother's Day, I actually want to first start off by talking about a mom that we find in Scripture, a powerhouse woman that we find in Scripture named Rahab. I'm going to tell you the title of the message here in a little bit, but let me just introduce Rahab to those who may not know. Rahab was actually a prostitute in Jericho, and I just said she was a powerhouse woman. Uh, We'll get there in a moment, all right? She was a prostitute in Jericho, which was a walled city of the Canaanites, and uh, she's not following God, obviously, at this point where we're going to pick up in the story, uh, but has an opportunity. Um, She's there in the city, and the Israelites are kind of coming in, and they're looking to conquer the promised land, the people that were actually living in Canaan at that time. So they send two spies to go and check out Jericho. So these two spies come into the city, and they find themselves at this house or this inn, if you will, of Rahab. Now, the king of Jericho finds out and heard from somebody that there was two spies from Israel that came in. And so they're trying to come and find the king and his men are trying to find where these two spies are. So they're tracking them down. They come to Rahab's house. But Rahab says, I'm going to make a deal. How many guys know that there's some divine appointments in your life that will come to you that you better capitalize on? Come on, somebody. Right? So she says, all right, I know there's going to be people looking for you. I'm going to hide you in the roof of my house but I need you to make a deal with me. When you and all the people of Israel and your God comes and conquers this city, I need you to save me and my family. How many of you guys know that that was an opportune woman? She's taking advantage of this opportunity. And so she, she says, okay, I'm gonna hide you. The king and his men come. They couldn't find them. They end up leaving. And she says, all right, well, you guys save me. They make a deal with her. And they said, if you would just show something in your house... A scarlet cord, if you will show that in your house by hanging it in one of your windows. So just imagine, this is Rahab's inn, hallelujah. <laughs> Rahab's inn, all right? And, and, and they said, if you would just take this scarlet thread and, and just make this a sign, if you hang it in your house, we will know that you're still with us, you're still on this deal. You hang that in this house, and when we come, And we conquer this land. We're going to remember you. We're going to remember the deal we made with you. And we will save you and your family. And so this is where Joshua 2.18 picks up. He said, behold, when we come into the land, this is the spies talking to Rahab. You shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. 
All right, so they go. They bring back with them all the people of Israel. They march around, you know, the walls of Jericho. You guys have heard that story. Those things come falling down. They come into this city, and they see the scarlet cord hanging from her window. So then this is where we pick up. They, uh, the people of Israel, with God's help, destroy all the people in this city. But look at Joshua 6.25. It says, but Rahab. Everybody say, but Rahab. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belong to her, Joshua, which is, by the way, another name for Jesus, Joshua saved alive. Come on, somebody. This is so powerful. She was going to be destroyed with everybody else, but she put this scarlet thread. She made a covenant with God and the people of God, and Joshua didn't destroy her with everybody else in that town. They saved her and her household alive, and she has lived in Israel to this day, the time that Joshua, the book of Joshua was written, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. What a woman. What a woman who recognizes God coming to her house through these two spies. What a woman who in this moment had a complete um, paradigm shift in her life and the lives of those who would come after her. So today's message is called this. When I grow up, I'll remember the scarlet cord. All right, every title of the message is going to connect with when I grow up. Some of the things we're going to talk about are going to have positive connections. I'll remember the scarlet cord. That'll be a positive thing that if you showed me this when I was growing up, I'm going to remember this later. We're going to talk about that. Other messages in this series are going to be when I grow up, I'm going to be negative things based on what you taught me as a child. And so again, I want to just give us some lessons on parenting from this story. All right. The very first thing I want to share with you, this is from this story, is that God can save your child. God can save maybe your grandchild. God can save your child. I want you to think about this for a moment. Who is this woman Rahab? Joshua 6.25 says, but Rahab the prostitute. Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. Now we can just kind of skip over this and many people even will kind of uh, water down this idea of who she was because God saved a woman like this. And so people want to think only God saves good people. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so a lot of people will like try to put on some, you know, other fluff around Rahab just to make sure, okay, if God saved this woman, she must have not been, you know, that type of prostitute. No, no, no. Let me tell you, this woman was selling her body for sex, for money. She was selling her body for money. This woman was a prostitute. Now, I want you to think about this. It mentions her father's house. So this woman was a child of somebody, and can you imagine how her parents felt about her profession? Some of you guys can. Some of you guys have wayward children. Some of y'all are, are, have actually done parented people, and now they are growing up, and they're choosing ways that you would not choose for them. I don't know who I came to preach to today, but I want you to know that if God could save Rahab the prostitute, God can save your child. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how wayward they are. I just want you to know that with God, all things are possible. God can save to the uttermost, the Bible says, to the very farthest corners of sin. He can save to the uttermost those who come to God through his son, Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this father that's mentioned here as as I was thinking about this woman and what she's doing, Rahab, what she was doing um, by prostituting herself. And I was just thinking about how uh, none of us at the end of the day are perfect parents. So throughout the rest of this series, we're going to talk about things, practical things that you can do to parent and raise up your child the way that they should go, the Bible says. But none of us are perfect parents. That means that all of us needed a perfect heavenly father who sent his perfect heavenly son. Come on, somebody who suffered in our place, who came and died for us to show us a better way. 
So I don't know what kind of parenting you did, and maybe the devil is trying to beat you up because of how your children are living today. Let me encourage a parent today. Listen, God's big enough to still save them despite whatever thing you did to raise them up. Come on, somebody. All right, that's not an excuse for us not to do it. You're gonna hear about this the rest of this message, how important it is to install good things in your kids. But maybe the devil is coming at you with condemnation and condemning you for where your child is. Listen today, I don't want you to allow him to do that anymore. Instead of just uh, being consumed with the condemnation of the enemy, let's wake up and let's start praying for our children. Let's start today. Come on, it's never too late. If you still have breath in your lungs, to continue to love them and point them to Jesus and ask Jesus to meet them right where they are. No matter how lost your child is, Jesus can still save them. I know that that must be an encouraging word for somebody, and I want to just encourage you with this too. (laughs) What's incredible about Rahab in this story is that Rahab actually had a moment and she heard of this one true God in her sin uh, while she was yet a sinner. Come on, she had this moment where she hears of this one true God, and you can actually find this in Joshua 2.10. I want you to read this with me, and I want you to think about where she was at this time. This is even before the spies come. This is what she said she had heard when the spies were there. It says, for we have heard now the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. Did you hear this? The people of Jericho, Rahab included, heard of this one true God. Before they get there to her house and give her this opportunity to be saved, she was already hearing of the ways of Yahweh. She was already hearing of the power of God. She was already hearing of the children of Israel. And so she says, we've heard of this. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, who you devoted to destruction. I want you to think about this. It doesn't matter how far away your child is from God. He still, God still has a way of letting them know about him. Be encouraged. This is why when we stand before the Lord, the Bible says all of us will be without excuse. Because God will make himself known to the people of this world. The Bible actually says creation is even a better preacher than I am because creation itself testifies of who this God actually is. So I know that your child even might be wayward. I just want you to know God has a way of speaking to them. God has a way of letting himself be known unto them. So parent, just be encouraged that God is on the move. He has a way of sharing, and then he might even have somebody come and share this gospel with them to give them a moment for their salvation. This is why you don't need to stop praying for them. Don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. Keep on interceding for them. Keep on asking God to reveal himself to them. So God sends these two spies to, again, Rahab, this prostitute, in her sin. They come, offer this salvation through the scarlet cord. If you hang the scarlet cord in a window from your home, when we see it, we will know. We will pass over that house. We will save you and your family from the destruction that will be on everybody else. Does that remind you of something in the New Testament? This is an Easter egg in the Bible. What we call an Easter egg is when we see Jesus in the Old Testament. We see his plan of salvation that we see revealed in the New Testament. We can see types and shadows and pictures of that in the Old Testament. Think about this. How are we saved in the New Testament? By the blood of Jesus, the scarlet blood of Jesus in the window, come on, of our heart. When we choose to believe that Jesus actually died and paid for our sins and he gave us an opportunity at salvation, when we just accept it. Did Rahab earn this? Did Rahab deserve this? Come on, she was a prostitute living in sin. If anybody didn't deserve it, you would think it was her. But how about the grace of God that we sang about today? 
That grace of God that can save to the uttermost. That grace that is a free gift offered to whosoever would believe. What made Rahab different in this moment is that she chose to believe in the one true God and his salvation offered to her. What makes us different from anybody else in the world? We're all sinners. We've all sinned, whether it was prostitution or something else. We've all sinned. What makes us different as Christians? We've just accepted the scarlet cord offered to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. When we believe in that and we put it right here in the window of our heart, destruction that is coming on anybody who doesn't believe will pass over us and we get the blood to save us and even the possibility of saving our family. It's incredible. And God gave this woman that opportunity in the middle of her sin. I just want to encourage a parent today. I know that seeing a wayward child is so hard and so tough, but trust in a loving God. Trust in a merciful God who is in the business at saving sinners. In the business of offering salvation to the Rahabs of the world. Can I tell you I'm so thankful for a mom and a stepdad who was praying for me while I was dead and lost in my trespasses and sin. The reason why I know I can preach this is because I've lived it. I was lost, but my mama prayed for me. Hallelujah. When I was in high school, I've shared a little bit of my story uh, with you guys before, but when I was in high school and I was just living in sin, I got expelled even from my senior year of high school. At the very end of my senior year, her, uh, my mom, she had a prayer partner that her and her prayer partner just began to intercede for me. And it was within a couple months. And she had been praying for me, of course, from the moment of my conception. But uh, it was in that season where the Lord intervened. And gave me an opportunity before I went off and began to live my life and go all sorts of places that I know the Lord did not destine for me. My mom and her prayer partner prayed for me. And Jesus showed up at my house. Come on, somebody. He showed up in my life and gave me an opportunity to turn from my ways and accept that scarlet cord. And guess what? That changed everything in me. That changed everything. And this is what we're going to be talking about the rest of this message. It changed everything even in my family. It changed then everything in what my lineage and Tavia was going to be. But it happened one day when salvation came to this house. Where Jesus saved this sinner. Everything changed. So this is why we're starting here, that God can save the Rahabs. God can save your child. Here's the second thing that I want to share with you. God can save your family. God can save your family. Joshua 6.25 says this, but Rahab the prostitute and her father's household. So it wasn't just her that gets saved. This, this Rahab, this one girl who's again dead in her sins, Because she accepted Christ, she invited the rest of her family. Accepted Christ in the future, accepted what God was doing again in that moment. The rest of her family comes, and it says all who belong to her. And Joshua, again, another name for Jesus, saved them alive. All right, so Rahab wasn't the only one who was saved. And you can find this even in the New Testament. When people come to salvation from God, it's a paradigm shift for their entire family. It's like the Philippian jailer. He gets saved. He gets baptized. And it says all who were in his house also did. This shows you the influence of parents and your salvation on the rest of your family. The rest of your kids and even your brothers and sisters and maybe even your parents. I know that we have some first generation Christians here at Diversity Church. Don't think it twisted. Your parents, Colleen, see the influence of Christ in your life. I want you to recognize this is a paradigm shift where everybody begins to see something in you that is different than what it was before Christ. This is just how it works in Christianity. This is why the influence of Jesus and his influence needs to be presented to the rest of your family. This is why the Bible tells us to witness and tell people about the testimony of Christ in our own life. 
You just see this paradigm shift, though, in Rahab and then in her family. They begin to follow God. They were converted into Judaism. They were converted into God's law. They begin to practice things. They were Gentiles before. They were not Jewish before, but they came and they said, I want to follow this one true God. And they begin to follow his precepts. Rahab and her family and her lineage begin to follow the Lord's ways for the very first time, and it changed everything in their family. What this is in Christianity in the New Testament, this is when we learn of Jesus. Yes, we get saved, but then we begin to be disciples. And we're discipled in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're recognizing that the blood of of Jesus, the scarlet cord, goes beyond me just saying, Jesus, will you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior? You're, You're saying, God, I want you to consume my life. I want you to wrap me up in your ways. I want to learn of Jesus's ways. I want this to be my foundation. I want this to be the foundation of my family's household. I can't tell you how important this is in parenting. This is the reason why we're starting this as the very first message in the series. We will get very practical later on in this series by telling you how the to-dos and the not-to-dos in parenting your kids. But the very first thing, the very first foundation of anything in our life has to be Jesus as a Christian. And can I tell you, there is no sure foundation for you and your family. There is no sure foundation for you and your family than Jesus Christ. This is why I want you to just imagine and think about what you're doing in your parenting when you're putting Jesus first. I want you to think about the significance of what is happening now in your household if you will establish Jesus as your family's foundation. Maybe that's for you right now as newlyweds and, and you're, you're just beginning this journey in, in marriage and family. But this is beyond even that. It goes on into all of your household. And so I want you just to think about this. This is so important. Luke 6, 47 through 49. And I preached this at Brett and Kristen's wedding just recently. And I believe how important just it is to make Jesus the foundation of everything in your life. This is why. Luke 6, 47 through 49, these are red letters. This is Jesus speaking. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. If you learn of the scarlet thread of who Jesus is, what his blood meant, but more than that, what is he calling you to do now as members of the family of God? All right? He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose... The streams broke against that house. It could not shake it. Is there some things in your family that are being shaken? You reevaluate, are they built on Jesus? Because anything that can be shaken will be shaken. I've seen this over the last couple of years through COVID. Things are being shaken. Why are those things being shaken? Why are people leaving the church? Why are people leaving God? Why are people leaving marriages? Why are families being separated? Ask yourself, are we built on Jesus, the rock? Because it says, if you are, you cannot be shaken because it had been well built But the one who hears and does not, those who hear his words and uh, that salvation's offered up, but more than just I'm going to heaven, but how to live here on earth. The one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Do you want a family, a house that is saved, there is no other foundation. There is no other name given among heaven, among men, whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. It's knowing him and knowing his ways. It's establishing that as your family's foundation. It is the scarlet cord. When I grow up, why did I title this? When I grow up, I'll remember the scarlet cord. When you let Jesus be everything in your family, you're not just talking about Jesus on Sundays. You're not actually just demonstrating how to follow Jesus when you come to church, although that's important. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But every day you're showing Jesus to your kids. You're talking about the things of God to your children. 
You're establishing his lordship, his kingship, his supremacy in your life. You're not having everything else revolve around you. You're revolving everything around him. That, that's when Jesus is the foundation. So what do you do in that moment? And by the way, I, I just got to point a few things out in this house as we're going to be talking about this. Notice it's Mother's Day. Uh, Barbie's sleeping on the couch. She's trying to take a nap. But notice also where her kid is. Hallelujah. Moms know what, I, what I'm talking about today. The kid's always trying to interrupt the mom from her nap. Uh, by the way, she has some Starbucks over here because that's definitely what the, what the ladies have to do. I also want to, want to show where the teenager is in the scenario. She in the kitchen. I think she even has her headphones on. Any other moms understand what that's like parenting a child or a teenager. But, but also I want you to think about this. We're Diversity Church, so back Black Panther's over here. He's on the toilet, yeah. Um, Nicole done that. By the way, in Christianity and even in Judaism, God wasn't against interracial marriage. We're going to actually learn that even through Rahab. I'm going to talk about this more in my third point. But, but I, I want you to know he wasn't against interracial marriage. What he was against is interreligious uh, uh, marriaging. All right, I'll talk about that in my third point. So we got, we got a mixed couple. We got Black Panther and Barbie together in the house, all right? But without Jesus as their foundation, I don't care who the parents are or the children are. This house will be shaken. But the more you recognize the scarlet cord... And again, we recognize who this is, the New Testament, by knowing what Jesus did for us. The more you just intertwine the scarlet cord in everything you're doing, you say, you know what? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So when, when an opportunity to, 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 to go to maybe work on a Sunday or maybe uh, soccer practice now that they have on Sunday mornings, like what, right? Or, or wherever, you're going to be like Chick-fil-A and you're going to say, I'm closed on Sunday because for me and my house, come on, we're establishing Jesus' lordship in our family's life. And our family's lineage. And so every time you do that, you're just making it a little bit harder for them when they grow up to leave. I'm not talking about leave your house. I'm talking about leave God's house. The Bible says for this reason, when they establish their own family moms, this is good for moms in here today. When your kids establish their own family, the Bible says they leave their father and mother. I know that's hard, Maria, right? And they shall be joined to their spouse and the two shall become one flesh. But what I'm trying to say is, is if you will establish the lordship of Jesus, and you, and, and you do that again through maybe even uh, not just coming to church, but like having devotions with your kids maybe once a week where you guys actually pray together. And you read the Bible, and don't make it weird. Man, my dad was so ridiculous growing up. He just wanted me to like learn about why my mom shouldn't have divorced him why she shouldn't so he would take scriptures out of context and he of course wasn't talking about his own sin and his abuse and him not beating my mom and those type of things he just wanted to preach his version of this i'm not talking about you just preaching something to them when they're in trouble come on if you don't have relationship with them if this isn't a part of your life no, when they get up and they grow up, that, that of course it's easy for them to live because you didn't show them what it was like to have Jesus as Lord in their life. You just told them how, how to have him as convenience. When you chose soccer over church, when, when you chose whatever over him, when you didn't pray for them at night, that you didn't cover them in the things that God, again, all I'm saying is they can still leave. But when you do those things, it's like you're making it that much harder for them to get away from Jesus because this cord is in every fiber of their being. This cord is all throughout their being because you've established Jesus as the Lord of your family. 
This is why the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. Who is the way? Jesus is the way. Come on, somebody. Not just following the law of the Lord, but following the Lord of the law. Right? Train up the child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart. It doesn't mean that they can't. We all have free will. But it means that if you just keep on wrapping Jesus around your family, they're going to see his goodness themselves. And it might not be in the day you wish they would, but one day revelation of who Jesus is is going to become real to them, and they're not going to want to depart. They're going to remember the scarlet cord. Please let Jesus be everything to your marriage. Let Jesus be the foundation, the center of everything with your kids. This is the only way. This is the only foundation that really matters most. And that leads me to the third and final thing that I want to share. The final lesson we learned from Rahab in this story is that God can save your family lineage. So he can save your child. He can save your family by establishing his lordship all over the family. But lastly, I want you to know this. He can also save the family to come. Your lineage that is after you through your chil children and, and their children's children. Joshua 6, 25 says, But Rahab, the prostitute in her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua was saved alive, and she has lived in Israel to this day. So she didn't just make a decision that one day just to get saved from the destruction of Jericho. She made a decision to follow Jesus every day of her life. Follow Yahweh, because at this point Jesus hadn't come. But follow Yahweh in every area of her life. Come on, how many times do you, people pray to prayer, but they're nowhere to be seen? That, that, no, that's not what lordship is, in, uh, is about. This, this is establishing Jesus again as everything to you. And so you can see that she does this, and she's still living in Israel at the time Joshua was written because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So what did Rahab do? This is a good point. This is such a cool study, by the way, this week as I was going over this message. What did Rahab do once she lived in Israel? Well, according to Matthew 1.5, she married a man named Salmon. Uh, you can maybe call him Salmon after the fish, but I'm not sure. That's how we say it in English. Probably a lot different in Hebrew. But this is the guy that she married, okay? According to Matthew 1.5, it says Salmon, or Salmon, was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Again, God's not against interracial marrying. Come on, Billy, hallelujah, right? What he's against is you having another God. Let me preach to the single ladies and the single men in the house today. If you want to find, again, Jesus in every area of your life, including your family, you better make Jesus the number one priority for the spouse you're looking for. All right? He's, he, he, he says that we're not to be unequally yoked. That has nothing to do with the color of your skin. What that has everything to do with is who's the Lord of your life. The reason why Salmon can marry Rahab is because Rahab had that salvation experience and she decided to follow the Lord and live in the community of Israel, which in the New Testament would be his church. She decides to say, I'm all in in this thing called Jesus. And Salmon said, I like this woman. She's hot. And now she also is following my God. Let's go. Who can say that that's how you found your girl or your man? Hallelujah. Come on. I can see it coming in the air tonight. Oh, Lord. Yeah. And that's how it works, right? They're good looking and they love Jesus. Or how about I say this? They love Jesus and they're good looking. Remember, don't put looks over Jesus either. Hallelujah, right? All right. But you see this. So Salmon marries Rahab and they created Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And Obed was the father of Jesse. And I'll get into that here in a little bit. 
But think about this family lineage of Rahab, the prostitute. This woman who was lost and dead in her sins. She had this paradigm shift. She had her own salvation experience. She begins to live in the community of the people of Israel. She begins to follow God in all of his ways. She left the old ways behind and said, God, I'm following all your ways. And then she met her dude at just the right time. She met this guy named Salmon, and they, and they had this other uh, child. Again, this is why this is generational, what I'm trying to talk to you about today, named Boaz. Now, you can read about Boaz in the book of Ruth. And Boaz was like the dude in the Old Testament, all right? This is the dude that if you're a single lady, you need to look for a dude like Boaz. The Bible describes him as this guy who is generous Gracious, kind, protective, a man of noble character. By the way, he was attractive. A man who was willing to step up to the plate and take care of his responsibility. Boaz. Some of us are, are just like settling for any old ass. I need y'all to hang on to the Boaz, all right? And if you can't see him now, Colleen, you're waiting for him then. All right? This dude was an amazing man, the scripture says. I mean, he's an incredible dude. And I was thinking about why. Do you think it had anything to do with his parents? Yes, it did had a lot to do because what I'm trying to tell you is the cycle of parenting will come into the next generation. The good things that you did, and this is even why we need to pray against all even the generational curses because they will show up in the next generation. But this is so cool when I was thinking about who Boaz was and how good of a man he was and even the things that he chose to do in his life by actually marrying Ruth, a lot of it was influenced by his parents and how he grew up. Who was his mom? Rahab. I want you to think about this. Rahab was outside of Israel. She was a Canaanite. All right? She did not follow the one true God. She wasn't born from Abraham's lineage. All right? She was far from God, but she chose God to be her Lord. All right? So she decides to come into the people of of Israel and follow the people of Israel. And guess what? You also have her marrying this guy in Israel named Salmon. Well, think about Boaz. Who did Boaz marry? Ruth. Who was Ruth? A woman who was a Moabite, away from the people of God, not following God's orders or his commands, but has a moment of revelation. And she even tells Naomi, her, her, her mother-in-law, after her husband died, after Ruth's uh, husband died, she says, your God's going to be my God. Your people is going to be my people. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you stay, I'm going to stay. This was Ruth's heart to follow the one true God, even though she was far away as a Moabite. But she came in to the people of God, and guess what? No wonder why Boaz was willing to marry Ruth, because he learned from his mom's example what redemption is all about. What will happen if you model not perfection to your kids, but redemption to your kids? We wonder why hate and racism exists. It's generational. They heard from their parents and, okay, this is, this is a people group we can't be around. No, 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 that's not what it was about. For him, he knew through his mom that God could save anybody because God loves everybody. No wonder why he was willing to look at Ruth, the Moabite woman, because he learned from his mom's example that God can save through the scarlet cord anybody. Can I say this to the parents in this house? How are you modeling a man or woman of God to your kids? The reason why I'm asking this question is because they're going to look for a spouse like you, whether you like it or not. Unless Jesus has come and again done a paradigm shift or whatever in them, I want you to know this is why parenting and other things become generational, is because the way you saw marriage modeled to you, the way you saw 
parenting, again, modeled to you, this is what you know, and so naturally you're going to go and do the same things, either good or bad. For Boaz, it's incredible because he saw some amazing things through Salmon and Rahab and their story and their love story. He was willing to marry Ruth, a woman who was a widow, and he was a part of her her redemption plan from God. It's incredible. We have to consider these things. Again, everything we do as parents matters to the next generation that we are raising up. But I want you to know the beautiful thing is, is when we remember the scarlet cord, we make this clear to them that Jesus' ways are better and, and that we begin to follow Jesus, even in our parenting, even in our marriage. This is how stuff like this begins to impact your kids and it lives on through them. Now, I want you to think about this. So again, we see Boaz and Ruth. And Boaz, again, came from Rahab. The next generation the Bible actually talks about was Obed. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And Obed was the father of Jesse. But then it goes on to say in Matthew 1, 5, Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of, of David, the king. So talk about the scarlet cord affecting not just Rahab, And not just Boaz, and not just Obed, and not just Jesse, you have a prostitute, and then four generations later, you get a king. Tell me only Jesus can do that for you and your family. Talk about the scarlet cord. And and then you have 28 generations from David. And then guess who comes from the same lineage of Rahab? Jesus. The real scarlet cord that can save you. That can save your family. And that can save generations after you (laughs) that one decision you made for Jesus thank God it doesn't stop with you that blessing can be generational that blessing can come on you and your own household but then it goes on beyond you this is why we named our daughter Tavia because Tavia means a new beginning Some of the stuff in my family lineage and some of the divorce and some of the drug use and some of the promiscuity and some of the things that were that were there because people weren't following Jesus before me. I said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and we're going to put his scarlet cord all over the house and we're going to teach his ways to our home. So that from generation to generation, come on somebody. Do I have anybody who's generationally following Jesus because those who went before you modeled that to you in your household? This is how we change the world. Before God established the church or even Israel, he established Adam and Eve in their household. And when you remember the scarlet cord, When that is taught and it's lived out through you, it will change your lineage till kingdom come. Would you take a moment and bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? Thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm John Collier, and I hope today has inspired you to love God and to love others more. We always want to take some time at the end to pray for you, especially if this is the first time of believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and raise again so that he can be keen and we don't have to be. Help us to learn more about you so we can live more like you. (laughs) We want you to connect with us and we want to connect with you. You can comment down below or go to diversitychurch.net and we'll see you again next week.